Uh, Steve's going to come and speak to us uh, in a moment, uh, looking at uh, the topic of uh, of prayer versus gossip, and um, and he's asked me to read a few words from James, the book of James, uh, way back toward the end of the Bible, and chapter three and verse three simply says this: When we put bits into the how, uh, into the mouths of horses to make them obey, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships for an example. Although they are large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder. Wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by just a small spark. The tongue also is a fire a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his or her life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Steve, come and make sense of those words, would you? Cheers, mate. And God bless you. Morning, everybody. Again, here we go. Are you ready? So good. Anybody uh, enjoyed Green Planet recently? (laughs) What a great start. Attenborough's latest extraordinary documentary, just getting into the growth of forests and trees, and it's been absolutely mesmerizing. If you can get it on catch up, it is like a spiritual experience as we see God the innovator and the creator and how things work. And the most extraordinary thing for me is seeing forests and woods in a whole different way that I've never seen before. So what we've realized over the last number of decades is that underneath the forest is this thing called the mycorrhizal network. This fungi network that connects a whole forest. And it's the distributor of information. It's the distributor of carbon and of water. When trauma happens in one area of the forest, the whole forest, through the mycelium network, through the mycorrhizal networks, respond to bring assistance to the part of the forest that is in trauma. If one bit of the bark gets infestated, if that's a word, Is it? I don't know. It's a Coley word. Let's copyright it and make some money. (laughs) If infestation comes into one part of the forest, there's an early warning system that goes out to the whole forest. Did you know this? An early warning system to be saying there is infestation in one part of the forest. And the trees respond by putting like this toxicity into their leaves to ward off predators to ward off infestation. The whole forest acting as one organism, responding to trauma in one area. Last week, last Sunday, was a trauma, wasn't it? As we gathered and as we heard information about our church, If you were a visitor here, we as a body, as a church, experienced a really hard Sunday last week and a really hard week this week as we begin to process the news that we heard. The news that uh, staff members who we love, who we treasure, are being made redundant. A decision none of us wanted. And this is a shock to the whole body. And right at the outset, again, Dave and Julie, John and Sabra, Brett and Becky, we say we honour you and we stand with you and we pray for you at what is a really challenging time. On the 23rd of November, I received an email from Fiona asking if I could speak in February. I couldn't speak in February, but I gave a few dates that I could speak. 
And so we landed on Coley, speaking on the 6th of March. In November last year, I was given the subject for today, prayer, not gossip. It's interesting that that was given to me back in November. And to be honest with you, in the light of what happened last week, I did speak to Neil and a few people and go, is this really the subject that we really want to be going for, you know, the week after? And there was a sense of actually, if something is planned in September, October, with no kind of choreography, it's not North Korea, here we are on this Sunday talking about prayer, not gossip. And we just thought, right, Lord, if this is what you want us to go for, then we're going to go for it. And of course, Coley gets the job. Thanks very much for that. No, it's right. It's good. The passage that we read earlier was written by the brother of Jesus, James, who was known as an early pastor who had oversight of a number of churches. In the context of today's title, it's interesting to note that according to church traditions, James carried the nickname Old Camel Knees. Imagine having a nickname, Old Camel Knees. And uh, he was given this nickname because of the calluses that had developed on his knees as a result of so much time in prayer. Another pastor who wrote the message called Eugene Peterson, he uses his language, extraordinary language, as a pastor. And this is the way that he shares, uh, uh, writes uh, James. Here we go, if we could have this on the screen. So this is James 3 in the message. It only takes a spark. Remember, sorry, let me start again. It only takes a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire. A careless or wrongly placed word out of your mouth can do that. By our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony to chaos, throw mud on a reputation, send the whole world up in smoke, and go up in smoke with it. Smoke right from the pit of hell. This is scary. You can tame a tiger, but you can't tame a tongue. It's never been done. The tongue runs wild, a wanton killer. With our tongue, we bless God, our Father. With the same tongue, we curse the very men and women he made in his image. Curses and blessings out of the same mouth. My friends, this can't go on. That's quite something to read, isn't it? On a Sunday morning. Pastorally, lovingly, calling it out. That's all it is, isn't it? Lovingly, pastorally, find it quite encouraging that written thousands of years ago and still working out the same issue relating to the way that we talk and engage with one another. When it comes to the use of our mouths, every single one of us is a work in progress, aren't we? We are all a work in progress. We are all working out our contradictions and incompleteness. Sunday evening in this space, 80 of us gathered with no notice at all to cry out to God for Ukraine. It was an amazing time together. 80 people at one time in a circle coming with this sense of unity and passion to see God doing the extraordinary in Ukraine. And we stood together and we cried out to God and we declared our prayers and we declared our songs together. We declared in a song in a cappella, we sang, Jesus, is you are our rock. Jesus, you are our fortress. Jesus, you are our deliverer. The power of agreement, the power of coming together in unity was extraordinary. And we all know that gossip could not be further away from that spectrum. Gossip has the potential to divide us. 
It breaks us apart. It creates tribes and sides and insecurity and power structures and hierarchical dynamics. And yet gossip is such a strong magnet that we are all attracted to. I have the pleasure every Friday of spending time here at the food bank and just that absolute joy of engaging with people uh, at the door. One of the conversations I regularly have with Gemma is this is so important, this emergency uh, support that we provide people through support, uh, through food. But how do we continually ask the upstream questions? Are we just going to spend our whole life in this emergency downstream? Or are we going to go upstream and really grapple with our partners who we work with, with what are the causes that, is in, that means that we're in this permanent state of emergency? Emergency cannot, downstream cannot be the new norm. We always have to go upstream and ask the big questions. In the terms of building a healthy culture in the church, scripture pastorally and helps us to go upstream all the time. Scripture taking us upstream. Romans 12 verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's not the slide. <laughs> Quadrillion connections in each one of our brains. Did you know that? Think about that. That's 16 zeros. Quadrillion connections. Who counts them? I have no idea. <laughs> Do you ever think about that? You know, just these stat, stats that come out. But a quadrillion connections in each of our brains. Our minds are something that's so sensitive that when a pattern develops, a pathway develops. And there are so many multiple pathways in our mind and in our brain. And when it comes to gossip, there is, so, there, there is a dopamine feel-good factor that comes. It's like a brain uh, 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 reaction to gossip. There's a neurology around gossip. And the, the reality is with all addiction, if we, feel God, if we feel good as a result of gossip, then there's a demand for more because we're always looking for the dopamine hit. That's addiction. I'm calling it out to myself. We need to go upstream to ask the Lord to reset our neurological pathways so that our mouths stand a bit of a chance. Upstream. Another scripture, Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from your heart. Jesus in Luke 6.45, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Oh my life, this is so disruptive, isn't it? Do you feel a bit of kind of disruption? God, take me upstream and create in me a pure heart, O oh God. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind upstream and guard your heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. I came across this quote recently. If you do not transform your pain, you will always transmit it. If you do not transform your pain, you will always transmit it. Counselors and therapists, I think, are some of the superheroes in our community, aren't they? And we've got some amazing people in our church that fulfill that role, who help people to go upstream to the source. I said to one of the counselors recently, I think we all should be in counseling. I think we all should be in therapy. 
We all are carrying things, aren't we? Carrying things from our past. We often transmit what has not been transformed. But if gossip divides and fragments us, prayer has the potential of uniting us, lifting us from ourselves into the higher and the wider and the deeper, as we witnessed last Sunday evening. Graham Munjim, in a, 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 in a response to the question that we asked last week about how prayer can unify us, he refers to the group of people and the significance of the group of people who came together in the development of this site and this building and a group of people in the old church who just came together to pray for the calling into this new neighborhood. We had somebody else... Um, uh, email in and talked about the significance of joining a new Facebook group which started small and every morning had prayer and worship that built into hundreds of people come together every morning and what a lifeline that that was the significance of prayer and starting the day like that Jesus shares an incredible relational picture and dynamic in some of his final words captured in John, he reminds us that prayer is not just sitting in a circle waiting awkwardly for somebody to start. <clears throat> prayer is the whole of our life. On the screen, my prayer is not for them alone, the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Final prayer, longing for us to be in union with God. This is what the longing is. Creator God, the author of earth time, calls us to a continual conscious union and expectation and dependency yes there are times where jesus was up mountains and in solitary places and on beaches by himself but most of this union is worked out in the day to day the hour to hour the journey in between when he arrives at a place this union is being worked out and modeled day in day out every hour I go to London a lot and because I don't have an office up there I often have space in between meetings and so there's sometimes where I have two hours in London in between meetings and so I never choose to walk I never choose to get a tube I always walk across London I find it more interesting but I've got into a habit of like, Lord, what do you want to do in this time? Is there anybody that you would want me to be speaking with or encouraging in these two hours? And it's walking with that kind of awareness and alertness and open and this kind of union conscious, this union with God, this consciousness to be saying, Lord, is there anybody? And you know what? About one in 20 times, Something quite extraordinary happens. I, I'm going to be honest and say this doesn't happen every three times. This is probably one every 20 times. But I am walking through London and I am meeting with somebody randomly on a street in the middle of Marylebone who is just about to get on a flight to New York who's feeling really vulnerable and kind of nervous about this trip. And here we are on a street corner in Marylebone praying for his trip to New York. How we met at that time, the, the divine choreography of that moment, of me coming from a meeting in Facebook and, and coming, you know, going to my next meeting over here and meeting him in Marylebone. Come on. That gets exciting then, doesn't it? Divine choreography. The Lord of heaven and earth brings two people together so they can pray on a, on, on a corner of a street. I turned up at an airport once and I realized that I'd turned up four hours before my flight. 
Four blinking hours. What am I going to do for four hours in a terminal that has absolutely nothing going on apart from a Starbucks? <laughs> the extraordinary thing was, I walked in and in Starbucks was a film producer who was on his way to go and do a, um, a, a thing in Vancouver. And it was like, Ralph, wow, great to see you. And for two hours, we sat in the terminal. And I, please, you, you need to understand this is not a Coley thing at all, but I felt like words, divine words just coming out of me. And he kept on going, have you been speaking to my wife? <laughs> and, and it was like, I don't, don't know where this is coming from. But it's this union, this, you know, this whole thing of how many hours do you pray, pray a day? Within the context of this ongoing union, that's the most ridiculous question ever, isn't it? Spirituality is not about metrics. This is about, this is about engagement. This is about our life. This is about everything of who we are and what we're about. Sorry, getting a bit carried away. Prayer is the context from where extraordinary things can happen. And prayer often starts as an individual. But you know what? This conscious union, this dynamic that we're all working out and we'll spend a lifetime trying to work out. When we come together with others who are also in working it out. Then sparks begin to happen, where two or three are gathered, when things are beginning to get agreed within the context of a wider body, when 80 people come together to pray for Ukraine, there's a sense of unity coming together. And then we go on to another level on Wednesday, as a result of the Pope, for crying out loud, doing a global call for the world to pray. On Wednesday, then, we are responding to that call, joining with a global body supported by the Archbishop of Canterbury, bless him, Justin Welby, here we go. And we are coming together at Tunbridge Bridge to do a prayer vigil in unity with our brothers and sisters around the world. That's where things get exciting, isn't it? Where we move from the individual to the church and to the global. It's a sense of always trying to be as expansive as possible in our prayer. I'm going to um, put a link for you to see just the extraordinary way God used King George in the Second World War, who called a national day of prayer, and a miracle of Dunkirk happened. Stories of business people in New York who, in a huge economic crash, started to bring people together to pray. And within days, thousands of people in Fulton Street, just by Freedom Tower, coming together to unite, to pray for their nation. And sparks were just flying everywhere. Prayer has the power to transform us, our churches and our societies. As Oswald Chambers said, prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. A big question has been posed to me, nearly there. Do you think we're in our last days? Has anybody posed that question recently? Do you think we're in our last days? Do you think we're coming to the final chapter that Jesus spoke about? My answer is I have absolutely no idea and nobody does. But we are closer today than we were yesterday. We are, that's all we can say, isn't it? But it is obvious that things are ramping up socially, environmentally, economically, and spiritually. And I think there is a challenge on all of us to be alert, to be on our guard, to be awake, to be on the front foot, to not sleepwalk into the comfortable and the predictable, but always see how we can be the best and most generous versions of ourselves individually and as a church. If the devil is out to destroy and to kill, which is scripture, 
then what is our response to that? I think it is to spur one another on like never before. We need one another like never before. Interdependence. These are uncharted times that is impacting every part of society and life, including the church. Accelerated by COVID, churches across the world are having to reset, to streamline, to reconfigure in response to a different world, different economics, and a cultural and tech revolution. Today, thousands are gathering in a virtual reality church which exists entirely in the metaverse where there are no heating bills or leaky rooms. This is where tech is evolving and developing and a whole generation of people are grappling now with spirituality in the context of virtual reality. We need to have our eyes open to this. There is change and uncertainty, but in the heart of this reset, I am excited that there is a waking up. There is a growing desire to pray, to simplicity, to seeking God for his power and for his kingdom to come. These are extraordinary times of challenge, but I think they are extraordinary times of opportunity and possibility. Not one person in this church wanted to make anybody redundant. We are all, all of us, feeling the pain. But how are we going to retain a healthy body that continues in this context, even in this context, to speak well well of one another? Positive gossip. Positive gossip. A church that draws out the best in one another. And tonight we are meeting as a church at 6.30 with a focus on praying, yes, for Ukraine. But also we're going to pray for the health of our church. And if it's just going to be an hour long. If you're able to be here at 6.30, we're going to work this out together and to cry out to God I'm going to finish with Ephesians 6. These words. Sorry, when I type these out, I never know what size font. And people at the back, you're having a nightmare with this, aren't you? I'm so sorry. I shared these words on Sunday night when we were praying for Ukraine. But I just think it absolutely encapsulates everything of what we are talking about. Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. And in the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. So pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. That's huge, isn't it? The challenge for us as community. Let's pray together. I want to share a miracle that happens for each, for every one of us. Our mouths are filled with billions of cells. Your mouth is maybe made up of 10,000 taste buds. The miracle is these taste buds are replaced every two weeks. Our mouths are being fully restored and renewed every few weeks. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart 
be honoring and pleasing to you. Lord, our desire is to be operating as one organism, as one body, as one church. And Lord, we so need your help. We so need your Holy Spirit. We so need your healing, your comfort, your hope and your perspective. Lord, I pray that this song and our communion together, our union together, would be profound and bring life to us individually and as a body. In Jesus' name, amen.